is uh, workshop 3B, uh, the future of skepticism online. We're going to do some crowdsourcing, or we're going to talk about crowdsourcing. Uh, I'm Tim Farley. Um, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction section here. I'm going to talk about kind of the overview of what we're talking about, and then we're going to get into the actual tools. This is, none of this is theoretical. Uh, all of this is actual stuff that skeptics are already doing, and we need more skeptics to do it. Um, uh, I am uh, Tim Farley. Uh, I am a software guy, uh, a researcher. I'm a uh, research fellow for JREF. I advise them on uh, uh, electronic media, internet stuff, that kind of thing, and I blog for them. I've spoken at the Amazing Meeting before. I've run workshops before. And probably most people know me as the creator of the site, What's the Harm? Um, but lately, I do a lot of blogging at skeptools.com, and a lot of it is about how skeptics can use tools better on the internet. And the other presenter is, is Derek Colanduno, who you probably know as the host of Skepticality uh, with Swoopy. And he also runs an awesome skeptic event, if you guys ever get to Atlanta. In the summer, uh, Skeptrack at DragonCon. It's a really fantastic event. We do probably almost as many panels and stuff as we do here, uh, but it's in, embedded in this giant science fiction convention, so we get to do get a lot of exposure to folks who might have not known what skepticism was. Four full days. And we're going to have a special guest presenter at the end, something brand new. Uh, that I think you'll be excited about. So what am I talking about when I talk about crowdsourcing? Uh, crowdsourcing is a portmanteau of crowd plus outsourcing. And the idea is that you make an open call for participation. You have something to, that needs a lot of work done. Uh, something that if you were going to do it in a conventional way, you would end up hiring a million interns or a, a thousand high school students or a, a whole staff of people to do. But you don't have the money to do that. So you, hire, you put out an open call and you say, hey, anyone who's out there, can you help us with this project? Um, and they vary. You, sometimes you bring knowledge. Sometimes you bring money. Sometimes you bring uh, the ability to do a little bit of work. Sometimes you bring some experience. But it's all about undertaking some kind of a task. And hopefully the idea is you get some mutual benefit. The person who put out the call will get whatever the thing was they want put together. And the people who help will get some benefit in the way of experience or just the knowledge of a job well done or contributing to a good effort. And there are crowdsourcing projects are all over the place now. Uh, probably the, the ones that you hear about a lot or at least have heard about for a few years are the wisdom of the crowd uh, type projects like Wikipedia, that sort of thing. But there's also crowd voting where people uh, vote on different things and, and try to find the best items in a, in a group. There's crowdfunding, which has been getting a lot of attention lately, things like Kickstarter, where folks who might have had to go to investors to start their company can now just put their idea out there and say, hey, you know, here's my crazy idea of a thing I want to build. Do enough of you want to do this that you're willing to toss in a little bit of money? And you start a company or you start a project. And people have done record albums and built products and built games that way. And actually, inducement prizes are kind of a type of crowdsourcing, too. And um, it's not new. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary uh, actually ran an open call that was essentially a crowdsourcing project for 70 years for folks to send in quotations that uh, went to the sources of, and uses of different words. And that was a giant crowdsourcing project. It wasn't done on the internet, obviously. It was done through the mail. Um, inducement prizes, the, there have been many. Uh, the uh, SpaceX prize and, and whatnot. The Orteg prize was the prize that Lindbergh was going after when he flew from New York to Paris. He was, he was after a prize. And they basically, essentially, that's a crowdsourcing project. I mean, you have one winner. But essentially, you're saying anyone out there who thinks they can fly from New York to Paris, try it. And the one who does it wins. And the Pillsbury Bake Off is another example that went for years and years. So what are the modern ones? What are the internet-based ones? 
We've got Wikipedia is probably the most famous. They've built an encyclopedia with over three million articles. It might be four million by this point. Uh, entirely by just asking people to type stuff, to write about things that they know about. Um, citizen science projects like Galaxy Zoo, Whale FM, and there's probably a couple hundred of them now, and you're going to hear more about those projects from Pamela Gay this weekend. Uh, fantastic thing where uh, science is gathering so much data now that we need, and, and our software isn't smart enough to classify all of it, so we need people to help. And I talked about Kickstarter. Another one is more on the kind of uh, commercial side of it is there's a thing called Amazon the Mechanical Turk, where literally you can just put jobs out there that have tiny uh, cash values on them and say, here, will, are you willing to spell check three sentences for a buck for me or something like that? And people will sign up and earn money doing it. Um, and the idea here, part of the idea here is to have some inclusion, have a way that skeptics, all skeptics, can help participate in projects that are helping to advance skepticism. You know, there's a lot of great blogs and podcasts. I have a blog. I'm on Derek's podcast. There's many other podcasters here, and they're all doing awesome stuff, but not everybody has time for that, right? Uh, frankly, I don't have time <laughs> to do the ones that I've committed to most of the time. Uh, which if you've looked at my blog in the last few weeks, you know that because I haven't posted that much because I've been getting ready for this meeting. Um, but the neat thing about crowdsourcing is, is you can do it in tiny little increments. If you want to help with Wikipedia, you can literally spend 30 seconds helping with Wikipedia and then go on about your business. And you've actually accomplished something that helps move the ball forward. And the idea is that by finding ways that skeptics can get involved in this and advance skepticism through this, we can get more skeptics involved. Um, and you can do it anywhere you have an internet connection, right? So you can do it from your couch while you're watching TV. Uh, and we need all the skeptics we can get to help out. Uh, another reason to do this sort of stuff is outreach. Uh, another problem somewhat with blogs and podcasts is they tend to sometimes preach to the choir, right? We tend to build skeptic blogs that talk to other skeptics about skepticism, and, uh, and it becomes this circular loop. Uh, how do we break out of that and, and actually reach the general public and t teach them about the things that we know about, about cognitive biases and pseudoscience and all this good stuff? So the idea is there's so much commerce going on on the internet, and so many different things going on on the internet, there's a lot of opportunities to intercept people while they're on their way to become a victim of bad information, while they're on their way to become a customer of a homeopath or a psychic or something like that. If you think about how people do that, there are ways to get in front of them using the internet. And it's an awesome opportunity. We didn't have this opportunity before. You know, 30 years ago, how would you intercept someone when they were about to hire a psychic? Would you stand in front of the psychic's building all day? Nobody could have done that. But there are things you can do on the internet to get people's attention right while they're trying to find a psychic. Um, one of the things I'd like to warn you about is you have to think a little bit about what kind of projects you're working on. Um, there's this thing that some people call it slacktivism, some people call it clicktivism, but it's sort of this false idea that you think you're doing something useful, but really you're kind of spinning your wheels online. Uh, there's a lot of kind of feel-good things that people try to get you to do online. And they're great, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with them, but there's the danger sometimes that you lull yourself into the sense that you're actually helping a project when the things that you're doing are actually not, um, not doing anything. You have to think about what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, here are some examples of things that can be slacktivism sometimes. Forwarding emails, retweeting things. Uh, you know, that is helpful to get the word out on some things, but if you're just retweeting stuff and, and feel like you're advancing skepticism just by retweeting stuff all day, you know, maybe it's not helping that much. Clicking like, there, everybody wants you to click that stupid Facebook like button now. It's useful to get things more visible in Facebook. It definitely is a useful thing to do, but if you're, all you're doing is clicking like, I, I don't know how much, thing you're, how much help you're, you're, you're causing to skepticism. Changing your avatar, 
A big pet peeve of mine that I'm going to talk about on Sunday is bombing online polls, which seems to be a big hobby of some folks. Really a tremendous waste of time. Um, science, some online petitions are a waste of time. Not all of them. Some of them can be very effective. You have to be careful about how you set them up and what your goal is. Um, but, uh, and again, none of these things are inherently wrong. I'm not saying don't do these things. If you want to change your avatar, by all means, change your avatar. But don't lull yourself into a sense that you're making a difference when all you did was change your avatar. Um, so how do you distinguish? What's, what's a useful crowdsourcing thing that you can do and what's a, a slacktivism? Uh, one of the things is, will it achieve a tangible goal? Like, you know, if, if, it's a, if it's a petition, it has to be a very focused petition with a specific target and a specific goal that's achievable. Um, and if it's creating content, think about where is this content going to be a year from now or five years from now. If you're writing a comment on page 15 of a forum thread, <coughs> Uh, is anyone going to see that a year from now? Uh, probably not. But if you're writing content, for instance, in Wikipedia, maybe it will still be there. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, are there more direct ways you can help? Um, or are you just doing busy work? Um, so what are we trying to do? What, what is the idea of all this crowdsourcing stuff? Uh, well, we're trying to do the things that skeptics say they're doing, which is educating the general public about science and critical thinking, right? We want to break out of this, let's all talk to ourselves about how great skepticism is and how horrible the latest quack of the week is, um, and let's get out to the public and, and warn them away from the quack of the week. Another thing is just basically improving the quality of information online. I'm an information guy, a website guy. And so, uh, to me, a lot of what skepticism about is about boils down to misinformation, right? Fundamentally, misinformation, bad information, whether it's science or a conspiracy theory or pseudoscience or whatever, it's all misinformation at its core. Um, and we want to improve the quality of information online or at least cause the information that's good to be a little bit more visible and the, perhaps the information that's bad be a little bit less visible. And we want to warn, warn the public about dangerous things. So all of these projects involve getting involved in a community and we will later in this, uh, we will talk about some, some projects that were built specifically for skepticism. But a large part of this is kind of co-opting uh, crowdsourcing projects that already exist. Um, and one of the things that you have to be aware of is you have to be aware of community 101. You have to be part of the community, okay? You can't just go in guns a-blazing in Wikipedia and say, okay, the skeptic's here now, I'm gonna fix all your pages. Um, you have to be part of the community. Wikipedia has been around for 10 years and there's a lot of people who spend a lot of their life on it and they don't appreciate the new guy coming in and making a mess of things. And one of the things you can do to lessen that fear of the new guy is to play by the rules, create an account. That's mainly a Wikipedia thing. Most sites make you create an account. But Wikipedia will let you edit without even you know, signing up. And I recommend that you never do that because it's just, it's looked at, you know, it's, people take a dim view of anonymous edits. Fill out your bio if there's somewhere where you can say who you are. Do post an avatar if there's a way to put a little picture. It doesn't have to be a photo. You can have a, you know, whatever piece of art, you know, you want. If you can, now I know a lot of people use an, a, a, a moniker, an anonymous name online for various very good reasons. And that's fine, but if you can reveal your identity and you're comfortable with that, that can be good too. Uh, for instance, uh, Wikipedia has rules that you're not, you're not, you're supposed to honor if people are being anonymous. Uh, but I, I am very upfront about who I am on Wikipedia. Uh, be nice to other people. <laughs> very simple. Participate in the various processes. If there's a friending process or a follow process, if there's ways that you're expected to interact with the other people on the service, do that. Um, understand the rules, you know. Uh, it's, it's very important that every site has its rules, has its expectations of its users, so you've got to do that so that um, you'll, 
be, people will feel like you're part of the community. And I, I always recommend to go slow at first. Now, some of the things we're going to talk about are fairly simple. When we talk about Web of Trust, there's not a ton uh, to learn on Web of Trust. So go slow may not apply there, but go slow definitely applies on Wikipedia. There's a big knowledge curve there in terms of learning how things already work. And a lot of people on that site that already know how it works. So you need to go slow at first so that you don't get yourself into trouble. So ask questions, get permission. Um, most of these sites have ways that you can interact with the other users. Um, one of the things I recommend is to always use, use as much of the service as you can. For instance, uh, if, uh, uh, for instance, we're going to talk about leaving tips on Foursquare. And uh, tips are just one of many features of Foursquare. And I would highly recommend that you not just create an account on Foursquare and start creating a million tips. Because people are going to look at that and say, why is this guy not doing anything else on Foursquare? And all of a sudden, he thinks he has a million tips for everyone else. So even if you're not that interested in the other features, try to use them to build up a usage pattern so people say, this is a regular user. This is a person who's using our service. So we uh, are not going to treat him like he's a spammer or a, uh, a, an abuser. Uh, so don't be a spammer. Don't, don't just um, stick with the skeptic stuff. Um, and I think I have a slide. Oh, yeah, the next slide has it. Um, but don't just be negative. Don't be harshing everybody's mellow all the time. <laughs> this is wrong. This is wrong. Change this. Try to be positive sometimes. It helps. Um, I know it's hard. Because as skeptics, we like to debunk things. Uh, but there are ways to find positive things to do. One of the things I do, for instance, when I edit Wikipedia, is I try to find every once in a while something completely unrelated to skepticism to work on. So I do uh, like historic buildings in the town that I live in. I just look on the Wikipedia and find something that doesn't have an article, and I'll write it. And I've spent, there's one article that I probably spent I don't know, 20 or 30, maybe 40 man hours on researching, going to the library, looking at microfilm, and wrote a really good article about this 100-year-old building. And the idea is to build up a reputation on that site. Is people will see that and say, wow, this guy spent a lot of time on this article. He seems to be really interested in Wikipedia. So if next time when I come in and take someone else's edit out, maybe they'll respect me a little bit better. We have to be aware that we are kind of, in many cases, sort of co-opting a little bit some of these tools. Uh, they are not explicitly designed to be skeptic. And some communities will be a little averse, or at least some people in the community will be a little bit averse. So this comes up a little bit on Web of Trust, but I've never had much of a problem with it. Uh, where some people on Web of Trust feel like skeptics using Web of Trust is not an appropriate use of the service. Uh, so you have to, again, go slow, be a little bit careful. And that's where mixing skeptic and non-skeptic use can be helpful, because people will trust you more. If you come in and you're constantly just doing Scientology stuff, uh, people will notice that, or the, or the algorithms that they use to manage the site will notice that. And they'll say, you know, this is somebody that's got an ax to grind about Scientology. They may not be doing their homework. Um, and be. I talked about being nice, be direct and polite. You know, skeptics like sarcasm and like humor, and it's fun, and I love it too. Everybody loves a good joke on the homeopath's expense. But these types of projects are not where an appropriate place for that, because you're trying to reach the general public, and they're not going to appreciate your, your really clever pun on diluted versus diluted. Uh, they're not going to get it. So just don't, don't, don't do that. Just be very straightforward and explain Avogadro's number and you know, go through this slow, careful thing and save the, save the sarcasm for the blog post that you're going to write later. Um, and don't forget, and this comes up in a couple of our examples later, to a certain extent, the other side is doing this too. Right? And so you've got to watch out for negative voting. I've run into this a few times. Uh, we'll see some examples on Web of Trust where it became, in fact, one of them affected me personally, 
where it was clear that somebody that didn't like skeptics was going out and basically doing what I'm telling you to do here, but in the opposite direction. And usually there's ways to leave feedback and leave counteracting positive votes and try to counteract whatever the bad guy is doing. We'll talk about that later. Now, not really specifically to this, but uh, it helps, is specialization. Uh, I've recommended this for years for skeptics. Um, skepticism covers a lot of ground when you think about, you know, just, just think about all the topics you're going to hear this weekend, by the end of the weekend, between UFOs and alt-med and conspiracy theories and critical thinking and logical fallacies and ghosts and psi powers and just go on and on. And there's a huge list of things. And it's really hard to be an expert in all of those things. So I really recommend in almost all aspects of skeptic, being a skeptic, to try to specialize. Pick an area out and make that your own. Because that's the only way you're going to get really good at it. And we've even seen instances, you know, in the last few years where major, major skeptics have kind of tripped themselves up because, you know, they have to know all this stuff and it's hard. It's really hard. Um, so occasionally a major skeptic will say something that isn't quite in line with the scientific consensus on this or, or that and get a lot of uh, heat for it. Um, they can take the heat. You as Joe Sixpack around the corner, you know, nobody knows who you are maybe. They're not going to, you know, give you the credit that they might give uh, a well-known skeptic. So I, it's something I recommend and it, it helps out with these uh, crowdsourcing projects too. Um, all right, so that's the intro part. And start closing windows so we can... Uh, Save some space. And we'll go right to our second section, which is about complaining. Uh, rate, rating and complaining. I figured we'd do this right off, because skeptics love to complain about stuff, right? Um, so why not do it in crowdsourcing projects? It's kind of a classic technique. We write letters to the editor. We write open letters to the media. Now blogs are often forums for complaining about this or that. Uh, the major organizations often release press releases when, you know, this, that, the psych crazy psychic does something. Um, there's pros and cons to that. It can be very focused and reactive to something that you know the public has been exposed to. But then, you know, you can't really control what happens because you're at the whim of the editors. If you're writing a letter to the editor or a press release, whether or not that's going to see print is up to the whim of some editor somewhere. And you always have the problem, the fundamental problem that you have with a lot of classic skeptical uh, methods, non-digital skeptical methods, is our uh, speech never quite has the visibility of the original speech that we're trying to counteract, right? Uh, Uri Geller gets a front page article and then we write a nasty letter. Um, you know, a tiny percentage of the people who see the front page article is, are going to see the response letter. But this is something where the internet realm can help us out because there are situations where we can maybe not quite get the visibility uh, that the original does, but we can come pretty close because of the power of uh, internet tools. And it's really exciting um, that we can get in front of as many people as the bad guy is, or get right next, get our content right next to his content uh, in a list. And the first thing, and probably one of the most exciting things in terms of just sheer impact, especially when you measure impact versus effort, is web of trust. Uh, this is a tool, it's actually existed for like five or six years. I just became aware of it about two years ago, and I believe it comes out of Finland, and the idea is to try to deal with the problem of there's too many websites and nobody knows which ones to trust, right? There's a lot of really cool, everybody knows Amazon, you can trust Amazon and hopefully they won't you know, lose your credit card number. Um, but if you find joeschickenshack.org who has this really cool you know, canned chicken product or whatever, how do you know you can put your credit card into that website and trust that guy not to steal your money? And Web of Trust directly addresses that problem. And it does it through crowdsourcing. It basically 
asks the crowd, okay, have you had a bad experience with this website? Did you buy something and then they never shipped it to you? Put in a vote and we will aggregate all those votes and expose them as a rating for each site so that the next guy who goes to the site can know whether or not he should trust the site. And it plugs right into your web browser. So the idea is that as you're browsing, this thing is looking up the ratings for these sites and it can tell you. 34 million people have downloaded that browser plugin. And Facebook is now using these ratings to rate the links when people put links into Facebook. So when you click a link that your friend put in, if it has a really low Web of Trust rating, Facebook will give you a warning. That's 900 million user accounts. So close to a billion users potentially can be affected by a Web of Trust rating. Um, and you, the first thing you see is this little red donut that you see up here. And I'll show you a screenshot of where you see that, but basically next to a hyperlink on your screen, you'll see that little red donut that says, oh, you shouldn't click this. Or if it's a good link, you'll see a green one. Um, and if you try to load them, you'll get a block message. Let's see what that looks like. Here's uh, Jim Humble. If you're following a couple years ago, there was a, and actually it's resurfaced recently, a guy named Jim Humble was selling essentially industrial bleach as a medical intervention for Crohn's disease, I think. Um, anyway, uh, horrible, horrible stuff. And he was selling it on like umpteen sites. He had all these people selling it for them. Well, somebody knuckled down and did the hard work of finding all those sites and giving them bad Web of Trust ratings. And this is part of a Google result page. So in Google, if I have Web of Trust installed and I happen to get a search that gets these results, I happen to type Jim Humble MMS, you can see all those red donuts there that say, don't click this, don't click this, don't click this. So hopefully people who aren't even skeptics will see that and say, oh, maybe I shouldn't be going to these sites. But what happens if you do? If you do, you see this screen. It starts to load the web page, and if you look, you may not be able to see it, but just in sort of grayed out behind that warning is the actual web page. And you get this giant warning that says this, this site is not, has a poor reputation. Maybe you shouldn't go there. Now, you can click a button and go to the site. It doesn't stop you. It's not censorship. But it says, hey, look, uh, maybe you don't want to be here. So that's an awesome way to reach people. It doesn't look quite that impressive on Facebook. But 30 million people can see that warning when they go to one of these websites. And one of the things that we've been doing since we discovered this and the skeptics got interested in it is we've been doing calls to action. And last fall, when skeptics got very interested in this Brzezinski character in Houston, who is a cancer quack, uh, mostly starting out of England because there was a kid who was sick and they were trying to raise money to send her to Houston. So the British skeptics got interested in it. And there was a lot of chatter on Twitter, and I sent this tweet and said, hey, do you think Brzezinski is trustworthy? If not, let's go, let's go uh, change his rating on Web of Trust to indicate that. And uh, I don't have a ton of power on Twitter, but it happened that the bad astronomer, who does have thousands of followers, um, saw this tweet and incorporated it into a blog post. And several hundred people followed that link and did some voting. And within a couple of hours, this warning started popping up on Brzezinski's website. And a couple of days later, we saw the uh, webmaster for Brzezinski Clinic show up in the Web of Trust forums. And boy, were they mad. <laughs> boy, were they mad. Uh, but Web of Trust left the ratings there. That's still that way. In fact, I think I took that screenshot yesterday. So it's still that way. If anybody finds Brzezinski's site, they get that warning right in front of their face. That is, that is some awesome power. Um, and all it, take, all it takes is a click, but it takes a lot of clicks, right? So we need everybody looking. There's thousands of these websites. You know, Brzezinski is a high profile one, but we need everybody looking for these sites that are selling this quack stuff or pushing astrology or all the things that we talk about and give them ratings. But let's talk about what those ratings are. You see that there's four donuts on that screen there. They do four different ratings because Web of Trust was designed for, for a, a lot of different things. It was designed for scams. It was designed for privacy problems. It was designed to, for child safety so people wouldn't, kids wouldn't go to porn. And there's some settings. So like, for instance, you can tell it to prefer the child safety 
uh, rating if you want. Only a couple of these actually really apply to us. And the main one is trustworthiness, right? That's pretty clear to me that trustworthiness relates to skepticism. Do you trust what is on this website? No. <laughs> it's cancer quackery. It's, it's nonsense. So give it a bad trustworthy rating. Now, vendor reliability, that's a different thing. Vendor reliability has to do with, I gave him money, he didn't send me the product. So I recommend that you don't vote in that unless you have specific knowledge about that, because that's not honest. Uh, privacy, same way. Unless you know that you put in your email address and it got out onto a spammer's list, don't vote in the privacy thing. I know the temptation is when you go to Web of Trust, like, you know, red, 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 red. Uh, but you really don't want to do that. Let's be honest. Pri uh, trustworthiness and I think child safety. It's kind of oriented toward porn, but I think when you're talking about an anti-vaccine person, child safety, I think it fits. Uh, so I, that, those are the two that I mainly vote, is trustworthiness and uh, child safety. So that's where when, earlier when I was talking about don't spam. Don't give ratings that aren't appropriate because people, you know, the, there are automatic algorithms and moderators on these things. I don't know how much Web of Trust monitors what they do, but certainly they must know that their system gets abused sometimes. So do the right thing and hopefully no one will have reason to uh, uh, doubt your votes. Um, another thing, and just briefly I'm going to talk about online reviews, kind of a similar thing, and this is a lot of different sites, iTunes, Amazon, uh, you know, you can, practically can't turn around without finding some kind of online review, and where the product being reviewed is something that relates to skepticism or relates to the, the folks that we oppose, like a book about, uh, you know, ghosts or something, or a good science book. Uh, that can help because a lot of times these votes are used to decide which products will show up in recommended lists and things like that. And the negative reviews are a uh, review is a good place to give people a more explicit warning, you know, because you can write something. You can say, okay, here's why what's in this book is wrong. Um, and this is a case where you have to be aware of the bad guys uh, making trouble too. And we have seen this where. Uh, creationists will latch on to the latest Dawkins book on Amazon and go in and write a bunch of negative reviews. And at that point, we need skeptics to go in and counter them so that the votes don't get skewed way down just because somebody's being a jerk. Uh, most systems have some way of kind of voting on the vote uh, so that you can feed back against people who are voting maliciously. That's what Amazon's look like, that little button there that says, uh, well, was this review helpful to you? Yes, no. Uh, so use that. If you see a review that really quite clearly looks like someone's being malicious and not honest about the contents of the book. And I, I, I you know, I admonish you to, to be honest yourself. Don't write negative reviews of books that you haven't read, <laughs> right? Let's be, you know, let's be ethical about this. Uh, you know, get a copy from the library. Don't buy it. <laughs> Um, or, you know, get a copy from somewhere and, uh, and read it, or buy the book and read it and write a review, um, or at least base your review on some good solid knowledge about what's in the product. Um, and let's see, where were we going to go from here? I think this is where we were going to bring Derek up to talk about Foursquare and Yelp since we were just talking about reviews. And there you go. What is this, the last day? Did it just start? I'm already tired. <laughs> oh, geez, I haven't turned around since I sat down. A lot of people know. Um, I'm Derek Alduno. I put my stuff down there. If you ever s listen to Skepticality, I'm one of the only voices that are left on the show because Whippy's like full time working and, and on like school all the time. So she wants to be on the show, but half the time she just is not home. Uh, so that's me. And I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Foursquare, I think, is the first one that's coming up here. Hey, look at that. So there's a few different websites where you can re leave 
reviews, or tips. Most of these are tips. Uh, and this is a little different than Amazon or Web of Trust in a way, or even uh, Wikipedia. These are things like uh, people have stores or they have services they offer. And especially things like you know Yelp and Foursquare, especially because Foursquare is about locations. So it's not a book or it's not a website. It's actually somebody's business or hotel or hotel or place like that. So you can create reviews and offer information about those places. Now this one again, you have to be very careful. You have to make sure that you read all the rules and you follow the instructions because if you don't, like the other things, they always have communities and they will get rid of your review. It's happened a few times to some of the skeptics, believe it or not. So, uh, don't do what I did in this, my example here. Because like uh, Wikipedia or anything else, you should kind of have a history of doing like real reviews and tips. Um, and this, I just kind of jumped in and I did this one thing. And it's not really quite a tip because I have this tip about a psychic that's in the Atlanta area. And my tip is actually a tip because it talks about the IG. You can get, hey, if this psychic can do what they claim to do, they can win $50,000. And if you're the person who gets them to do it and they win, you get money too. So it is kind of a tip. But I should have had something else more than just that. So my example is good and bad at the same time. So you should probably be a little more, I don't know, gentle than I was here. Um, and the thing I reason I say that is because recently, is Bob here? No, he's not. Bob is uh, the head of the IIG Atlanta. He's moving that pretty much in the next week. But anyway, he did this, the same exact thing I have here. I actually copied and pasted his thing. And after I did this, um, he came to the meeting and said, oh, by the way, uh, I got banned from Foursquare because a bunch of the psychic people from that location started to like complain and Foursquare actually banned him. So that, when I say you have to have a little more class, I, I just copied and pasted what he did, even though I don't think that's, bad, that's too bad, but I guess he did it on many different places and then they claimed it was spam. So it, he used the same exact blurb. I did it on like three places. He did it many other places. So what did you say? say again? What did you say? Uh, it should be right there on the screen. Oh, I have it right here. No, I can't either. It's very small. <laughs> I forget. It's basically the blurb from the IEG website about if you can prove that you have powers under scientific testing, you, you win you know, $50,000 and the person who finds find you wins about what, three or 2000 or something. Yes. 5000 5000 Hey. That wasn't what I wanted to do. Oh, crap. Oh, what have you done? Sorry. Do you know what we're, what we're doing now? Anyway, it's pretty much what it is. It's almost a. It's this right here. Yeah. So it is a tip, and my counter argument about them saying that it was spam, it is a tip. I mean, what the hell? It is your business, and you, you basically gave people a way to like get themselves money and you a lot of money. But, you know, they don't like being called out. So there's a better ways than just jump in there and like, you know, call them out. You could do a little classier. Um, I have a little more history on Foursquare because I've done many other reviews for other things like hotels and things. I used to travel about 97% of my life for business and work. So I used to actually write things about the hotels I liked and things like that. So hopefully they won't ban me because I've done this three or four times before I knew that they were doing that. Um, but it's a good way because the nice part about Four, Foursquare, has anybody used Foursquare before? Yeah, everybody has like, you know, one of these things that's connected to the internet all the time anymore. And when you load that up on Foursquare, it now it does tips around you. So if you're in an area and there's a psychic around there and that, 
that tip will actually show up. So people who aren't skeptics will see something like that. And they'll say, hey, that's interesting. And maybe they'll want to go to that psychic and win $5,000 and ask their psychic to do it. They're not going to like that, but it does promote the mindset and it does promote critical thinking because therefore they're going to say, why won't you? You're, you're not going to get me $5,000? You say you do this stuff. So it could actually have some really cool things. Um, another way you can use Foursquare, many of these psychics actually don't have any locations because the, the loca locations that Foursquare have to be put in. So many places that you want to rate, they don't have them. So then create one. Now, me and Tim actually talked about this a little bit because we're like, well, you know, you again, have to follow all the guidelines and things. Let's say there's a psychic near you and you go on the fourth grade and you want to like put it down and they're not there. Well, you can actually put in their location yourself. They don't, they, you don't, they don't need, you don't need permission from them. You can do it yourself. And the weird part about this is you're drawing attention to the psychic or the bad service or the moo merchant, whatever you want to call them. Um, but, and again, they shouldn't really mind because you're giving them advertisement they didn't take the time to do, as long as you use all the official information. Because if you read their, their terms and guidelines, you can't do anything bad. So you have to actually put in their real stuff. So go to their website, put in all the real information, and then you can leave my, my, my tip where I, I should have, in all of these, you really should probably put like a, a, a more enticing tip, one that's not as hit you in the head with the book as I did. You know, hey, by the way, I think this guy's a scam, so here, try to win some money, because if they're, if they're not, hey, you make money. Everybody knows what they're, really you're saying is that they're not gonna go for this. So it, it is, and it is kind of, you know, to the, to the psychic themselves or the person that owns this, look at this store, they're gonna say, oh, they're trying to disparage us. So you have to try to make it soft and fuzzy at the same time because you want more people to be the more flies with honey. So anyway, you can, you create these and you can do it that way. Um, and it works because like I said, if you pull out your phone and you go to Foursquare and nowadays, no, tips around me. So they'll pop up. So it's kind of a cool, play, kind of like the web of the trust, but in the flesh, using the internet, whichever that kind of works, maybe. Anyway, and there's another one like Foursquare, there's Yelp. Who hasn't heard of Yelp? Um, Yelp is kind of like we're Foursquare, but unlike Foursquare, Yelp can be used for not only locations, it can be for almost any service. Uh, is kind of mainly meant for locations, but you can use it for other things. Nice part about Yelp, I think last time I looked, Yelp actually has more people that use it more than Foursquare because Foursquare marks itself right at people using mobile phones. You can use the website, but it's not meant for that. You, Yelp is like, I don't know, Wikipedia for you know reviews of locations and, and services, in a way. <laughs> Um, so you get more eyeballs at Yelp. Again, they're just as a, uh, they're a lot more vigilant, vigilant with their uh, monitoring of the uh, Yelp stuff because the Yelp community is hardcore, trust me. Uh, <laughs> so like again, don't be like me and just you know, go in there with, the, you know, with your skeptic you know, schlong swinging around and say, by the way, this guy's a, you know, Try to make money. Yeah, it doesn't really work. So you can be a little more gentle. But again, it's another great way to draw attention to locations that are already there. And you can actually, again, oh, whoa, don't do that. Um, you have the pros and cons to all of this stuff. You things like you can create a location and it might not get noticed by the owner. So the nice part is, if they didn't take the time to put in the location or at Yelp or Foursquare, the nice part is they probably aren't paying attention. 
So what you put in there might last for a while, unless the community gets around to it, like they did with Bob. So you have to walk a really gentle line, but if you do it right, I haven't been banned yet, and nobody's actually taken away my reviews on either one of these, which I find amazing, because I use the same exact wording that Bob used, so I don't know why I got away with it. Um, and then, uh, another pro in a way, and this is one that Tim brought up, and I never thought about it, you're kind of creating a, a uh, getting a map of all the merchants of woo in your area that you can point people to, to maybe have in people's heads when you talk to friends and family or people that in your area and then you hear the name of the, some spa that has this nice, nice fancy new age you know, name and you hear that, oh, the people there are like offering you know, high priced you know, Reiki for you know, free. High price for free. Everybody knows what I mean that by that. Here, you come in for this, you know, soothing music and a foot rub, and for five hundred dollars, and I give you Reiki. Um, so things like that. So it's culminating a nice map for the community to look at, and also you're getting the word out. And a lot of people that aren't skeptics at all will see this information, which is the best part. Is you don't. You're not ever saying anything skeptical, really. You're just saying, hey, did they, you know, somebody went to this place? And go, what is this? Um, this recently happened with my wife, of all people. Um, I actually recently wrote a, one of these on Foursquare because uh, I saw a location um, about a place in Atlanta, and it happened to be on, um, what is it? The, the Samantha takes over lady on Bravo. She, used to, she mainly does care, but now she does everything. And she happened to come to some woo place in Atlanta to like help them. It's a chiropractor that had Reiki services and all this stuff. And I saw it on TV and I said, what the hell is this place? So I went on Foursquare and Yelp. And I put all their stuff in there too. And uh, they were in there. And it was interesting to see those comments because it was on the TV show and they had many unhappy customers. So I took more, I put some stuff in there because obviously the people actually had come to that place and they saw it on TV. They said, oh yeah, this guy's a complete fraud. So it was great. Um, then my wife was like, oh, I didn't realize it was all crap. It's like, honey, you live with me. How'd you not know? <laughs> so I don't pay attention. She never listens to my show. She doesn't. So she's like, oh, I didn't know you were on then. She does this all the time. She says, my dad was talking about this. Have you ever had a show about this? Yes, honey. You don't listen to my, you don't listen to my show, do you? Anyway, so yeah, so it's, inf it's good to have this information because you can point, you know, family, friends, things like that. So, a con again, you have to follow the guidelines and rules. Like, Tom, like Tim said, like Wikipedia, like Foursquare, especially Yelp, they have a big community. And don't go crazy in there and just start stomping around and say, I'm Mr. Skeptic. And, I'm gonna point out every single place here that you never should go to. I didn't get, I should have put all my examples because um, it was like I said, I used to travel all the time. So I had a lot of stuff on Foursquare that was you know, just regular reviews. Um, things like, you know, by the way, this hotel, they allow dogs, not just see I did, seeing die, I dogs, any dog. And uh, I actually had people comment on my comment and said, hey, I've done this, this is great. So then I, it builds up goodwill. And then I just have the list of those links. And then it's time for Tim again. So you're done with me. Um, yeah, actually, that, uh, that Foursquare screenshot that he showed uh, happens to be right across the street from where I work. So one day I actually saw Bob's now deleted um, tip come up when I was checking into the. I put the same tip back on the same <laughs> website he got banned for. <laughs> yeah. um, which is a cool new feature that they put in Foursquare just recently, like last month, uh, where uh, tips, it used to be that the tips would only show up for the place that you were at, but now tips will show up uh, for nearby places if there's no tip where you're at. 
Uh, and the idea is to help you discover, oh, by the way, there's this really cool restaurant across the street you might not have known about. And ours could say, oh, by the way, you could win $5,000 by turning the psychic in to the uh, skeptic police. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, try to word it a little better than that. Um, all right, so we're going to talk about curation, and I'm going to try to get us back on time. Um, curation is the idea of trying to sort of organize the information that's online so people can better find it. And there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in this area uh, right now. And one of the reasons I bring up uh, curation is because we've got a lot of stuff. If you look out there, I, you know, everybody's got their favorite blog and their favorite, everybody goes to Dr. Novella's blog and, and uh, you know, the Skepticality is, is one of the top podcasts and we've got our favorites. But if you actually look out there, there are hundreds and hundreds of skeptic blogs out there. There's a lot of good stuff that I, I think is getting sometimes overlooked. Um, and these are rough figures based on a thing called Skepticator that somebody in Australia built uh, that kind of aggregates it all. And actually these figures are from last summer, but uh, at that point there were like 700 feeds that he was aggregating and it was like 250 posts a day. That's a lot of stuff. So how do you find the good stuff? How do you find the really cool articles that you should be telling your skeptic friends about? And I did an, an, a census of skeptic podcasts, and this is fairly accurate data from 2005 through 2012. This is just sheerly the number of skeptic podcasts and I, just out of sheer laziness, didn't even include the atheist podcast. So this is just the, the podcasts that have sci at least some science in it. Um, not the ones that are just talking about religion or atheism or whatever, which there's a lot of great podcasts that do that too. Like I said, I'm just lazy and didn't want to have to <laughs> chase all those down. But there's like 95 of them now. There seems to be this weird thing where it seems to be flattening off right now. But uh, huge, huge growth. And uh, there's like uh, 10 different languages and stuff like that. We'll talk about language issues later. So there's a lot of content out there. There's uh, uh, probably 100,000 blog posts. Uh, I know as of last summer, there were at least 3,800 episodes of various podcasts. That's actually an undercount because when I did my recount this year, I realized that I had done a severe undercount last year. And there's at least 9,600 videos on YouTube and Vimeo. Uh, so that's a lot of stuff to wade through to find the really juicy stuff. Uh, and skeptics need a way to keep up. They need to find the, you know, I need to know where the really good, you know, who has the best pithiest explanation of homeopathy or acupuncture or whatever. So when somebody asks me about it, I can send them right to that resource. And when there's new stuff coming out, I need to know about it, right? Um, how do you find out about the latest study or whatever without relying on another blogger, especially if you're a blogger and you need to find out about this stuff? Um, and if you just Google some of these things, depends on the search, Google can get really clogged up with the believers, right? It's hard to narrow down and find the good skeptic stuff in amongst all the guys trying to sell you homeopathic uh, uh, Berlin Wall or whatever. So we need better ways to find things. And, the, and one of those ways is to curate stuff, which is someone, you or you or you, just making a, a list or finding a subset of skeptic stuff and saying, here's, here's what I think is the good stuff in this category. Uh, and one of the keys is looking for patterns or relationships, right? Not necessarily just a category, but finding things that kind of relate to each other or can be used together and build on that. And then publicize your work, right? Let people know that you build it. And that's kind of the standard way that blogs used to work historically. A lot of bloggers would write, you know, five, you know, at least one, but probably five to ten blog posts per day. And a lot of them would be very short. Hey, here's this news story I saw. Um, here's why it's interesting. Check it out. Um, and the repetition keeps the community engaged and, and keeps, your, keeps everything going. Now that's kind of changed these days. A lot, some bloggers still do that. I don't do that on my blog, but a lot of people have moved that to other medium that we'll talk about in, in a minute. But another way is to just do a website. My website, what's, what's the harm, is just a curation project. I didn't create any of that information. All of it is stuff that I found 
Uh, some of it was news stories. Some of it was stuff that other skeptics had already written about. I just organized it in a new way by putting all the cases on one website so you could find them in one place. So it's a pure curation uh, situation. Here's one that somebody created uh, sometime last year called Skept TV, and all it is is a Tumblr. And a Tumblr is just a blog, but it's, it's designed to be very simple to post to, so it's, you can do those short posts every day. And whoever runs this, I'm actually not sure who exactly runs it, so if you're here, come see me. Um, and they just look for good skeptic videos. And I, I'm not sure how often they post at this point, but it was at least one a day. And so if you wanted to see good skeptic videos, here was a way to do it, right? And that's a curation project, right? Social media for a lot of people, I know a lot of people don't use Twitter, give Twitter a bad rap. It's all about people saying what they had for lunch. Um, no, it's not really. I mean, if you follow a lot of 13-year-old kids, maybe it is. But the way I use it, and a lot of my friends use it, and I follow a lot of skeptics, is we use it to exchange information about skepticism, exchange links. This is just four of my posts from uh, last week sometime. And you can see that I posted two news stories. I posted a tip about TAM, uh, some information about uh, where the schedule was online, and my skeptic history post, which is just something that I do every day just so that I have something to post every day. Uh, that's educational. And that's a curation. This is what I'm interested in in skepticism. And if your interests somehow intersect mine, then by following me on Twitter, you can benefit from what I'm curating. And so you can do that too. Now the really interesting thing about this is now uh, there's interesting side effects of this now. And I wrote a web uh, blog post about this a few weeks back. This is a tiny slice out of a Google result page and this is what I personally get if I type Reiki into Google. And you'll notice that the first one is a Reiki website, but the second one is a skeptic blog post about Reiki. Now that's not a very highly ranked skeptic blog, and the only reason it shows up in my results is because I'm friends with that person on uh, Google+. And you'll notice it has a little person icon to the left of the blue link, and right underneath it, it says Angela Meadon shared this. So the only reason that result shows in my Google results is because I know Angela Meadon online. And that's a powerful thing. Now, of course, she's just showing me a skeptic post, but imagine if you, if you had family members who were thinking about going to a Reiki person, and you had posted stuff online, there's a way to insert something right into the Google results that they'll see, right? And all you do to do that is just post a link on Google Plus um, and make sure you're friends with the people that you're trying to reach. So that's a cool effect of curation uh, that's come from new features that Google's built. Just briefly, I'm gonna talk about um, a freeze page or website. There's uh, a lot of situations where Quacks and psychics and whatnot will get caught saying something they shouldn't say online, like making a claim that's illegal or trying to make a prediction uh, retroactively. And there are tools like Freeze Page is one, Website is another. There's a number of different ones that allow you to, if you've ever had to link to pages that are fairly old, you know they disappear. It's, it's, it's the horror of maintaining what's the harm is all the news links on what's the harm are expiring all the time and people are emailing me, oh, this link is broken, this link is broken. Um, and that's why these services exist, because if you want to cite something, like if you wanted to cite a, a web article in a paper, a scientific paper, the only way to cite it and know that the person who's reading your paper could see your citation is to use website. Uh, well, we can use that to capture, say, the predictions page on sylviabrown.com and see what Sylvia Brown was predicting last April. And then if she then says, oh, well, last April I predicted that there were going to be two chimpanzees loose in Las Vegas today. I don't know if you saw the news, but there were some chimpanzees loose. Uh, <laughs> strange things you find out when you go up to your hotel room and turn the TV on. Um, and if she tried to go and edit her web page and lie and say that she had predicted that, you could go back and do that, and then skeptics have done this. There was a case a couple years ago with a psychic, psychic to the stars, psychic Nikki, 
And when Heath Ledger died, she obviously went right to her, here's my predictions of who's going to die this year site, and stuck Heath Ledger's name in it, and a skeptic blogger caught her doing it because he had done a freeze page of her predictions page. Um, so that is, that is an awesome power, but that's something, again, where we need, we need a big crew of people doing this stuff because there's a lot of these sites out there and nobody, you know, we don't have massive multi-million dollar organizations to do this on a massive scale. So we need you to pick one psychic and you to pick another psychic and get this done. There's a lot of services that you can use for curation type things, organizing stuff, and they all work in slightly different ways. You've got social media like Twitter and Facebook, which sort of pushes out your curation to other people. There's the bookmarking sites like Delicious, Reddit, Pinterest. These are ways where you collect what you're interested in in a place where people can come see it. Uh, Reddit is interesting because it has a special skeptic section. So that's a fun way to uh, sort of help skeptics organize in a group curation, essentially, of here's what skeptics find interesting today, is the skeptic Reddit. And then we're going to talk about the Q&A sites in a second, the Stack Exchange. And then, of course, just simply emailing stuff out is the old-fashioned way of doing it. And again, specialization, I think, is the key. Curation doesn't make any sense unless you've got some sort of slice that you're trying to curate. I specialize in harm stories, skeptic history. I do a little bit of infosec and technology. But I don't do, like, alt-med theory. I don't do conspiracy theory stuff. There's a whole lot of stuff that I don't post on because I let other people be the experts on that. So let's talk about Q&A sites. These are kind of, it's kind of a new type of website that's just come out in the last couple of years, or at least the good ones have just come out in the last couple of years. There have been a lot of really crappy Q&A sites over the years. And the idea is to post answers to very focused questions. You know, people have these questions of how do I reset the, you know, the input on the back of my Marantz receiver so that it's in stereo again? Yeah, or you know, just some crazy thing that you know somebody on the internet knows the answer to that. Um, and the idea is that if you collect enough of those questions in one place, Google will start bringing, whoops, bringing people to you. Well, how do you collect enough answers in one place? You do it through crowdsourcing. And there's a lot of people who just happen to know, I happen to have solved that problem, so I know the answer to that. Let's collect what I know, and then it'll be there for someone else to benefit from. And the idea is that these sites solve it better than the older sites. There's a bunch of older sites. Uh, there was one for programmers called uh, uh, Experts Exchange, which became a kind of a joke because if you read the name carefully, it looks like it says Expert Sex Change. <laughs> um, but it was horrible and everyone hated it because they would show you the question and they would show you the page and then they would put these ads in front of the answers or they would tell you you had to subscribe before you would see the answer and it was just this blatant attempt to, we might have this information you need but you have to pay us 1995 first. So there was a guy, a couple of guys who decided we can do this better than them and put them out of business. And they built this thing called Stack Exchange and this is their diagram. They claim that they are sort of in the intersection of sort of four different types of websites. A wiki, which is sort of a group edited database of articles. A blog, which is a, a sequential set of articles. A forum, which is people responding together in, to topics. And something like Reddit, where people are uh, finding things that are interesting and, and the interesting stuff bubbles to the top. And they claim that their site is designed to be the intersection of all four of those, that little star right in the center. And the way it works, the way they make it enticing and the way they get you to answer questions on the site is they've done what they call gamification. And this is a big part of Foursquare, too. One of the things that makes Foursquare addictive and makes people want to do it is they've turned it into a game. You get points and you get badges and stuff. It seems really stupid, but there's this, in some people's brains, there's this little weird thing where you like those little rewards. And because fundamentally Foursquare is pretty boring, right? You're logging where you're going. Um, and it's gotten, there's some other benefits. I've actually gotten money from Foursquare, like American Express will give you discounts on things and stuff like that. But the gamification, basically they put points, they put badges, and the idea is you're trying to 
raise your reputation. You're trying to be able to say, hey, I answered the most questions. I'm the smart guy. And it incentivizes everybody to come up with good material and get the good material up to the top and make the site better. And everybody feels invested in what they're doing. And of course, you have manual moderation, too, because you've always got jerks on the internet that are going to try to ruin things. So you've got to have some people watching. But a lot of the moderation is done automatically through this game system. So they've been very successful with this. They got several million dollars of uh, investment money uh, last year. They're now at 87 different topics. They started with programmer stuff. They've now got, you know, photography, server management, you know, you name it. A lot of it is technical stuff. There's 2 million users, 4 million questions, 8 million answers. It's all free. The, actually, all the content, I think, is licensed. And they did a skeptic site for us. Uh, Richard Stelling in the UK, uh, they had a process where you could suggest, suggest a topic. And he put in skepticism. And it was debated. And they kicked around some ideas. And they launched the darn thing. So here's a question that someone wrote, which is, and, and this gives you an idea of what the site is about. What formal education did L. Ron Hubbard have? That's a very specific question that goes to, you know, what is Scientology about? Was this guy qualified to tell us anything about anything? The answer is no. <laughs> but rather than write a 5,000 word essay about why Scientology is terrible, this page answers that one specific question. And they've done some technical things that I won't get into on how this page is designed and what the URL is so that these pages rank really highly in Google. So if you do a search like L. Ron Hubbard formal education, this is the number one answer. And that's a powerful thing because if I wanted to put a website up that said this exact same thing and for it to be the number one answer, I'd have to do a lot of work to do that. I actually wrote that answer because I happened to have read the article in New Yorker that came out last February that went, had the exact answer to this. And I wrote the answer up and I footnoted it and hyperlinked it. And you can see to the left of the question and to the left of the answer are some up down arrows and a number. That's where the voting goes on. And so the questions get voted on and the answers get voted on and the good ones pop to the top. And at some point the questioner uh, chooses an answer that they like and that's what that green check below the um, 11 next to the answer is, the green check says, yes, I think you've answered this question correctly. Um, and of course, with skepticism, it's a little less clear cut than the technical sites. Like if I ask you a question about a camera, at some point, we're going to be able to figure out what the right answer is. Uh, skepticism, sometimes the answers are harder than that. But it still works amazingly well. So this is a great example of its curation because you're curating information. But it's also a good example of how you can get information into Google and solve a very specific skeptic problem without having to do all that crazy stuff of setting up a blog, setting up a website, understanding what SEO is, all that nonsense, uh, and spending any money because they're already spending the money. And one of the things you can do is they've made it easy recently to ask and answer your own question. So you can, uh, if you happen to, in your reading and skeptic travels, find some little tidbit that uh, is hard to find and you feel like it answers a very specific question, just go to Stack Exchange and answer, write a question. And there's a way you can click the button and say, I'm going to answer this question and write the answer. And they actually have a specific badge for that. And it's a great way to put these little skeptic gems out there on the internet so people can find them. There's another site called Quora which is basically the same concept. It's different software. It's, I, the only reason I mention it is it's gotten a lot of attention. So a lot of people are on Quora. So it might, and I've seen a few skeptic topics pop up on Quora, so it might be an interesting place to put some skeptic content from time to time, or at least keep an eye on if people are asking questions. Uh, but certainly the skeptic stack exchange is a go-to place um, to go, and I think we're, Oh, we did all right on that. Um, OK, so let's bring Derek back up. And he's going to talk about uh, captioning. Oh. 
So another big way, I'll, Tim brought up the podcast thing earlier. You saw how many podcasts are out there. The thing about podcasts is that most of them are just radio shows, so they're not in text form. So you, they don't get searched by the search engines because they don't know what's in, in that audio file. Google doesn't search everybody's podcast. It can't. So one of the things that we can crowdsource or you know help other things like Skeptic Media with is create this trans transcripts for every piece of Skeptic Media that's mainly just audio. And this extends to things that aren't just audio because some skeptic video is also not searchable either. It's not, it's for the same reason. So things like podcasts, vodcasts, they have a very hard time getting any Google juice because they don't show up in the search engine. Because what I talked about last week on skepticality is probably not on Google right now. Because it's not, it's not text, it's just money audio. Uh, this is going around on, going on quite a bit lately. Uh, Monster Talk, if either Blake or, or Ben is here, um, they actually take donations to pay for transcription services so they can get their shows transcribed and then have a show notes page that links to the entire actual episode as an article like in a magazine. Um, and that gets searched by Google. Great stuff, but they actually have people like when Tim brought up things like you know crowd crowdsource funding. That's what they use. They get people to donate a little bit of money, and then they actually have professional people go and transcribe the stuff, and then they actually have a back catalog of all their episodes in text form. That's a great way to do it. Uh, Skeptics Guide Universe. Everybody knows them. They're you know see them every morning after this one. Uh, doing their live show. They actually use the same idea, but they actually have a wiki and they make everybody, they have people go out there and actually type in their ooh, transcript for them in a wiki. So then people go in, they actually listen to the show and they tape it all in and then over time, when people have time, they eventually actually fill out their uh, episodes in a wiki format. Some places have an advantage. Advantage, If uh, uh, Mr. Skeptoid is here, I, I don't like you because his show is very short. And uh, he actually pre-scripts everything and then reads from a script, so he has a really easy time at this. He just puts his file up there and says, hey, Google, come get it. So he has a really good, great, great way to do that. So most of the shows don't, don't have that luxury. So. Like me, I we do a, a skepticality. We have, gosh, we have an episode, a long form interview or two episode every episode, and then we have three other three or four other reoccurring segments every time. And then I'm not requiring people like you know Tim and all the people who actually contribute to my show to give me those scripts. I could do that, but I've been too too uh, I don't know absent-minded to actually ask that question, because I could probably do that, because I probably do have scripts, but I don't think about it. But, uh, so you, most people go, well, what can I do to help this problem? I don't have time to do, a, I mean, other, most people go and say, well, I don't have time to do a podcast, but I want to help. So you can help. There are really cool services that make this a really easy job. Right, I'm going to talk about, two, about three versions of this. There's uh, one that, that uh, that Tim found is called Amara. It's actually, his real name is Universal Subtitles, but they have that fancy Brandon name, which is uh, Amara. Um, and then there's a, a free system. Uh, now, Amara Universal Subtitles is actually mainly for uh, videos, YouTube or uh, what's the other one? A Vimeo. It's for that type of thing, not audio. Uh, Transcribe, which is a free system, they're both, they're, the other one's free too, um, but it's just a uh, open source project where you can go and it has the same features, but it's just for audio, not video. Uh, and then what this happens is you can then use these transcriptions for YouTube because 
the best things to do, which is what I do, every episode of Skepticality, if you see that picture of me and Swoopy in cartoon form in Skepticality, and then I have the episode and the date, I put that on YouTube. It's just, all it is is that picture, and then I have under it, on the video, is just the, the, the sound file. And then I get a lot of, actually, it's amazing how many hits I get on YouTube, and there's no video. It's just the audio. And a lot of people subscribe to, that, to my channel on YouTube almost as much as they do on my normal feed, which is just skepticality. And I don't know why they would do it that way, but they do. Um, a lot of people are just YouTube fanatics, and that's what they do. And all it is is a radio show with a picture that just stay in, stays there. If I, was, if I had enough time in my life, I would actually make a little a, a slideshow of it to make it more interesting, but I don't have that time. So the nice part about YouTube is you can put uh, captions, closed captions in YouTube. And the words that you're hearing actually show up on the screen. If you have a transcription, that's the problem. I don't have all my stuff transcribed. So the uh, Amara Universal Subtitles, this is actually a screenshot of, of me using that service. This is my latest episode. And you can see in the bottom right is the uh, control system where you can, it tells you, you know, you can put shift tab and you can go backwards and you can go forward a little bit and then you can listen to the actual show and then type in that little box under the, the picture what is going on at that time and then you hit return and then you can actually create the subtitles. At the end of this process you say, okay, I'm done. And then it shows you the subtitles and then you can scrub around on the video and say, okay, does this match? And they can match up the thing and then you say, okay, and then it sends, it, and then it sends those subtitles to that YouTube video so when people go there and they click the thing and say, I want to see the subtitles, they're there. It was kind of cool. A lot of some people like, you know, then you can actually, those subtitles actually get searched by Google because guess what? Google owns YouTube. So if you help up podcasts like mine, <laughs> because um, I, I, I try to do this, but I mean, I, I don't have enough time to do every single episode, but, um, but if people help podcasts this way, their content, even though it's audio, all the words end up in Google, and Google owns YouTube, and therefore you get higher rank rankings. The thing is, this works for video. Here's a, there's one that's called, uh, the ter worst name ever, really? It's actually what it's called, WR Really. It's, but it's I, because of the, it's, it's really. Yeah, really. Um, it, this is just for audio. Same thing, but it's just audio. Um, nice part is you can, take, you can do this, send the file to the webmaster of that show, and say, hey, put this on your website, because if you actually put that in your show notes as a page that people can like, click, click on, Google will actually search that. So when somebody types anything that was talked about in that episode, it'll pop up in the, in the Google search results. So that's another way you can really do it. Um, and I just talked about this, because this is, shows you what actually it looks like. Um, here's a, another way you can help out. If you don't want to use the, the funky tool, you can actually go to any video on YouTube, upload the actual audio file with a little picture, and then YouTube will actually try to um, translate it. Uh, you can't really see what it's saying there. It's Google's trying to like understand my voice, which is really bad since you know my, I, my, my voice is kind of fake because I had to relearn how to talk completely. Um, but I, I, it doesn't matter because even my, my uh, interviewee had really terrible translation as well. But you can you actually go there to YouTube and download these Google provided captions and actually try to correct them that way. So you can all have, you know, it could probably help, maybe, but it is there if you call it that way. But you know, it, it tries, not that well, but if anybody's, it's, who here has used Google Voice? Oh wow, okay, a couple people. If you ever use the voicemail version of that, because I can, t I tie that now to my iPhone, so when people actually send me voicemail, it actually gives me the actual what Google thinks they said, which is entertaining more than actually useful. 
Um, but he does an okay job for I got an idea. As my dad, I understand. I, he blurs around. I guess I know what my dad usually says. So, so it tries badly, but it tries. But like I said, transcripts boost visibility a lot because Google likes words more than anything else. Text words on a page because that's what you search with. Um, until you know, we all get you know that weird search with sir, that they're trying to make where you can like shove in a video and then I'll try to find something like it. Because has anybody here tried the fancy Google picture search? Yeah, how well did that work? <laughs> Not that great, but they're trying. But until they get there, really, transcripts, transcripts is the way to go. Um, then here are some links to the things I talked about. Uh, here is the link to the Monster Talk uh, page on Skeptic, because uh, Skepticality and Monster Talk are the official podcast of Skeptic Magazine. Um, and so their website is off of skeptic.com, and they actually have a page there where you can actually donate to their transcription effort. Uh, Skeptoid already knows that show, but you can actually go there and actually see all his transcripts for every episode. Um, there's the uh, the link to hey look I did Skeptoid twice, yeah. Um, <laughs> SGU has I link to their uh, they actually have a is there hardcore they actually have a uh, actual web US they actually have a domain just for their transcript um, effort which is kind of cool of them um, so I actually have that so you can actually go there and see how they use their wiki to do this um, here's a link to Amara which is actually, their website is not Amara, it's actually the name of their company, was the Universal Subtitles, don't ask me. And there's the, really, really? Um, and then YouTube, which if you didn't know how to get to YouTube, I don't know if I can help you or not. So I'll go back to Tim again. Yeah, one of the things you can do with universal subtitles is it makes it easy to post multiple language. Uh, so, yeah, you had a mention of it on there. Um, and uh, so the idea being that you could transcribe it and then people could come in and line by line translate it into another language and we could get a lot of the skeptic content into other languages, which would be very cool. I occasionally have folks uh, ask me for translations of what's the harm. Uh, we're going to talk about Wikipedia, and I've got way too many slides here because we've got to make sure we leave time for Shane. Uh, so I'm going to gloss over a lot of the slides here, but I'm going to talk about the main thing. Uh, Wikipedia is probably the big project that a lot of folks have been working on, mainly because Susan Gerbic uh, really jumped on this. I blogged about Wikipedia. There have been a lot of skeptics working on Wikipedia for years and years, but we started looking at it. Uh, a little bit more carefully and saying, hey, you know, skeptics should pay close attention to this. Um, now, a lot of people are skeptical of Wikipedia, right? You know, there have been famous incidents where it's gotten things wrong, uh, and how could an encyclopedia that's written by everybody possibly be any good? Uh, there's no central authority. There's a lot of problems with it. But if you really look at it carefully, it actually works amazingly well. Um, but I would argue that it doesn't matter whether or not it's working well uh, because of, and we've mentioned it several times here, search engine results. Google is, knows everything, right? And everybody relies on that. So therefore, uh, we need to make sure that uh, Google has results that people want to see or uh, has results that we want people to see matching the queries they're going to make. Now here's the thing, here's a fairly illegible slide, but this has like several hundred skeptic terms like cryptid, debunking, faith healer, feng shui, Gonsfeld, homeopathy, iridology. These are all our core topics. And for every single one of these, the number one hit in Google is the Wikipedia article on that topic. So guess what? Because of that Google, let me back up a second, that Google gullibility issue, uh, that's where people are going to be learning about these things, whether we like it or not. Now, you can rant and rave and say, get off my lawn, and say you hate Wikipedia, but like it or not, people are learning about homeopathy from Wikipedia. 
And so I feel like we have to go edit that article, right? We, it might stink, uh, but we have to because people are, are, are using it. And even the ones that are not number one, there's a number two or a number three hit, and there's technical reasons why Wikipedia ranks so highly. Now the alternative is to try to rank highly ourselves, but that's a very difficult thing to do. And there are pros and cons. Obviously, if you build your own website, you have more control, you can specialize it better, you can include topics that Wikipedia would say no to, and then the users co are coming to you instead of going to Wikipedia. Of course, the problem is, is that's a lot more work. You have a lot of competition. Like, for instance, trying to get on that first page of results for homeopathy, that's, that is a hard nut to crack. There's a lot of competition out there. Uh, and you've got to do that in an ad hoc, ad hoc basis for every topic. Um, another way to look at this is traffic. And I looked at this actually after last year's TAM because of a remark Susan Gerbic made to me. I actually ran a year's worth of traffic numbers because Wikipedia is completely open. All their traffic numbers are published. And I know my traffic numbers for what's the harm. And those two gra these are four topics, each of which have a page specifically about them on Wikipedia. And each one has a specific uh, page on them on what's the harm. And the two on the left are very high ranking uh, pages on Wikipedia, homeopathy and chiropractic, right? And they're the two top pages on what's the harm uh, that are specifically about a, a topic. Um, and I lose big time, right, to Wikipedia. Wikipedia is getting like 50 times the amount of traffic that I am, or uh, sometimes 100 times the traffic I'm getting. And even the two uh, topics where I do really well in Google, attachment therapy and ozone therapy, who knows why, what's the harm ranks like number one or number two on those two topics, I'm still like 18 times, Wikipedia still has 18 times the amount of traffic that I get. So that's, that's a, you know, a sobering graph there that, you know, I can do all I want to my page, but Wikipedia is still going to get more traffic on theirs. So we need to be making sure that the content out there is as skeptical as possible. And Wikipedia is built that way. I'm going to start going fairly fast. Uh, I think most of this slide deck is posted somewhere. We're going to post these slides anyway. Um, but f Wikipedia has what's called the five pillars. Uh, which is neutral point of view, it's free content, you should be respectful and civil, but they don't have firm rules. And the idea is to have sort of a framework but encourage people to come in. So they want us in there. They want as many editors as possible, even skeptics. And there are a lot of skeptics who are fairly high ranking editors on Wikipedia. Um, there is a, I will, you know, admit to you, there's a, a lot of disadvantages to Wikipedia. It's not an easy thing. It's not like Web of Trust where you can go in and start clicking red, 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 and make a difference right away. It's a huge culture. There's a lot of lingo. People fling these three-letter acronyms around like NPOV and expect you to know what that means. Uh, there's lots and lots of guidelines and rules, and it's, sometimes it's not clear which ones are rules and which ones are essays written by someone. Uh, I've gotten lost in their help files sometimes. Um, they have a rule about civility, but it sometimes turns into kind of a joke. <laughs> uh, people do get un very uncivil and yell at each other on there. Uh, and we don't have control over it, right? Ultimately, uh, we can write all we want and someone else can delete what we write. But they are welcoming to new editors and they need new editors. They actually kind of have a problem right now where uh, they've, early on in Wikipedia there was sort of a land, uh, not really a land grab, but they needed articles very badly. So there was a, a lot of room for people to come in and write stuff. Uh, now not so much, it's kind of filled in, so it's harder to find things to write about that you're not gonna get uh, some pushback on. So, uh, but there's a lot of good advantages to it. It's really easy. You don't have to know HTML or programming. Uh, like, for instance, create a hyperlink. You just use a bracket and the URL and the name of the link and a bracket, which is much easier than you have to do in HTML. If you want to create a heading, it's just a couple equal signs in the heading and a couple equal signs, and all stuff like that to do the basic formatting on the page. Um, you don't have to write an entire article. Most of the things you do on Wikipedia are little tiny edits. So if you can learn how to use the editor and learn how to fix spelling and things like that, 
Um, and a lot of times, if you make a mistake, other people will come in and fix it for you. So you don't have to worry too much about, you know, you're changing Mount Rushmore. You're not. It's going to get fixed. But one of the things that's really good about Wikipedia is if you really read the rules of Wikipedia, they are pro-skepticism, okay? They have a rule called reliable sources. You have to have a source that is a real source, not some crazy guy's blog post, like an actual paper or a, a news article. You have to have a neutral point of view. You can't go off on the, you know, the crazy uh, and say homeopathy is real. You've got to be neutral about it because clearly there are a lot of people who say it's not real. Um, there's a notability thing, so you can't just put every conspiracy theory in the world in there. They don't belong in Wikipedia. And there's a whole set of rules about what they call fringe theories, so that the real crackpots can't get their articles in there for very long. And no original research, which more crackpot stuff. So I kind of see two roles for skeptics on Wikipedia. One is to obviously edit the pseudoscience and paranormal articles and try to make them as skeptical as possible. You have to be aware that articles like, like homeopathy and chiropractic and, oh, heaven help you if you go into the Scientology articles, uh, those articles have been poured over for years and have thousands and thousands of edits on them. So you have to be really careful when you go in and edit them. But at the same time, there's hundreds of other articles that need a lot of work. And you can do quite a lot and not attract a ton of attention if you're working in some more obscure topic. But another thing, and this is kind of what I focused on for a lot, is create articles about skepticism. Uh, I wrote Richard Saunders' bio on Wikipedia. I wrote Harriet Hall's bio on Wikipedia. And that's a great way for them to promote themselves uh, and to be you know, considered more uh, you know, important or at least you know, the, the, here, the, you know, Richard Saunders is a real guy. Look, he's in Wikipedia if someone doesn't know who Richard Saunders is. Um, and again, that's something that you know, a lot of the other folks on Wikipedia don't really care that much as long as you do your homework and put the footnotes and stuff in there. So I have a few tips and I'll go through these very quickly. They mostly intersect with what we talked about in community. Uh, create an account. Uh, create an account. Don't edit anonymously. Uh, it actually gives you some advantages. You can look at your own stuff. You can get notifications. Create what's called a watch list. That's a, a, a list of articles that you're interested in. And then Wikipedia can very easily show you every time those articles get edited. So you can kind of keep an eye on them to see when the nuts come in and try to vandalize them. Uh, start small. Start with little things, spelling errors. My first edit was I was researching something for what's the harm where a guy got eaten by an alligator. Don't ask. <laughs> but it was at this historic site in Pakistan, and I wanted to, I was adding a map feature to what's the harm, and I wanted all the cases to be on the map. And it's like, well, where is this place where they have all these alligators at this temple? And I figured out where it was on the map. And Wikipedia has a thing where you can put a map location on an article. So I put that in there, and that was my first edit. Um, simple stuff like that can get you started. And then you build up a history. And that makes, lets people trust you. Look at this guy. He's been editing for two years before he, he wrote his own article. So maybe we should be a little bit more respectful of him. Don't be, this is more jargon, Wikipedia calls it an SPA, a single purpose account. Don't go in there and just edit Scientology. They take a very dim view of that. Uh, in fact, there have been giant wars over that particular topic. But homeopathy or whatever. Don't just go in and focus in on your skeptical topic. Do some other stuff. Edit things about your school, your favorite uh, band, uh, your hometown. Avoid the battlegrounds. You know, look in the history of the article. See, you know, don't go into L. Ron Hubbard and start changing things immediately. If you look in the history of that article, you'll see people have been fighting over that article for years. Not a good first choice. Uh, do use the features to communicate with other people. There are ways that you can, you can leave messages to other editors and stuff, and I will admit it's extremely clunky and 1987 vintage uh, web stuff, and it's horrible. But try to use it and talk with the other editors, and people will trust you more. Uh, imitate other pages. If you're trying to create a page, find one that's like it and copy what it is. 
Uh, the big thing you have to do with Wikipedia is you have to kind of be a little zen, and once you put something on Wikipedia, you just have to separate yourself from it and say, okay, that's not mine anymore. Uh, because if you get possessive about the text and somebody comes in and changes it, that's a, re that's a recipe for a lot of heartache. Um, creating articles about skepticism, I already talked about that. A big thing that Susan emphasizes in her project and I emphasize too is try to create links to skeptical resources and articles. So if I find something in Skeptical Inquirer that's a good source for some other article, I'll stick that in as a footnote. And hopefully that will lead people to Skeptical Inquirer when they're reading that article. There's a thing called the scratch space uh, that you can use, especially if you're creating a new article. You can do your work in there and people will ignore you. Uh, instead of working in the real article. Because if you change something in the real article and someone else cares, they'll get in your face pretty quickly. But if you do your work in your scratch space, you can uh, work quietly. Uh, the Fringe Theories Notice Board is actually, it's kind of entertaining actually to read because it's sort of like a catalog of what nut jobs are showing up at Wikipedia to push their crazy theories this week. And you learn about some interesting, crazy skeptic stuff that's like, wow, I didn't know anybody believed that. Uh, so it's kind of fun to read, but it also sort of shows you where the battlegrounds are that week. And the big thing is to footnote like, like crazy monkey. Uh, that's my defensive uh, uh, maneuver is, you know, just footnote everything like you're writing a paper for a really anal retentive professor at college. And that becomes your defense. And you find good sources for everything and you say, look, I have sources for everything. <laughs> and. Uh, the nice thing about it, and here's just one little quickie thing on the end, is they added this thing called Google Knowledge Graph, and a lot of it is drawn from Wikipedia now. And if you live outside the United States, you probably haven't seen this yet, but it's in the Google results. So when you do a Google search, a panel like this will sometimes appear on the right-hand side. And it's supposed to be kind of a summary. So like if you search for a movie, it'll be a summary of what that movie's about. And if you search for people, you get stuff like this. And this is the cancer quack Stanislav Brzezinski. And it, with people, it shows you related people, right? So down here, the related people are Max Gerson, another famous ca cancer quack. Uh, Julian Whitaker, I don't know who he is. And uh, Suzanne Summers, nut. But look at right there, number three, Reese Morgan. Why is he there? He's a skeptic in Wales. And he's there because he got involved in, a, in, you know, in an argument online with uh, Brzezinski, and uh, that all got documented in his Wikipedia bio. And so now people look for Brzezinski, and maybe a few of them click on Reese, and maybe some of them learn about skepticism. Maybe not all of them, but it's a, you know, it's a way to get their attention. So Wikipedia, I've got a bunch of posts on my blog. I recommend you go to Susan Gerbic's blog. It's called Guerrilla Skepticism on Wikipedia. You can just Google that. And she's got all sorts of stuff where she's organizing people to target certain articles and things like that. Uh, she was going to be here, but her plane, she's like literally on a plane right this second. So, yeah. All right, so let's get our super secret guest up here that I teased on Twitter. Um, this is Shane Greenup. He has built a tool called Rebutter, and I, we've been talking about co-opting uh, projects for skepticism. This is one that's built essentially for skeptic stuff. Hi everyone, uh, so I'm from Sydney, Australia and we started building Rebutter in February this year. So it's still very new, we're in the um, public beta development stage. Um, and the whole thing spawned from an event that happened about a year before we started working on it. Someone shared this link on Facebook and it was a press release article saying that a study had shown that vaccinated children suffer from more illnesses than unvaccinated children. And I'm like, that sounds like an interesting study. I think I want to look at that. So I clicked through and I looked at the study and of course it was a self-selected biased group at vaccineinjury.info identifying how healthy their unvaccinated children were and comparing that data with CDC data. So I could see straight away the problems with the article. But what I wanted to do was, I had a friend on Facebook that thought that this was a good article to share. And I wanted them to understand why it wasn't, what the problem 
was. I didn't just want to say it's wrong, because they'd say whatever, that's your opinion. But I also didn't want to put the time in, I didn't have the time at that point in time, to go through and systematically address all the claims raised in it. So I wanted to find someone else that had already done it. Because I've been around long enough to know that someone else had already written a re rebuttal to it. So whenever you're looking for things on the internet, where do you go? I went to Google. And I typed in the most obvious thing I'd think of, the title of the article. And what I got was copy after copy after copy of the same article. I got at least three pages worth of exact copies of that one article. Because someone did a press release and every quack website out there thought, great, this is awesome, this shows definitively vaccines hurt people. So they copied it. Uh, I searched for about half an hour adding rebut, rebuttal, reply to, answer to, trying to find this rebuttal to it, um, and I just couldn't find one. And I knew what I wanted at the time was just some magic button off the website where you just click on it and it takes you to a rebuttal of it. That's what I wanted. And I looked for a year trying to find someone else that had done it. And I couldn't find anything. There's a lot of web annotation services out there. Some of you may be familiar with them, where you can um, do a uh, plug-in installation and you can highlight text on a page and comment on it. Um, but none of them were quite what I wanted. I didn't want specific, detailed analysis of a page. I just wanted to click a button and see someone else's pre-written article that opposed it. So we started working on it, and that's obviously the idea, to connect just a direct link between a claim article to the rebuttal of it. Um, and so this is what it looks like in practice. Um, the implementation of it is a browser plugin. So you need to install this into your browser, Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome. At the moment, we've only developed in Chrome because we're still developing. We're very close to launching, and as soon as we do that, we'll start expanding into Firefox first, and then probably Internet Explorer and Safari. Um, so what we have here is, in the top right-hand corner is the little rebutter symbol. You browse to a page. Now this is a Wall Street Journal article. Wall Street Journal, huge paper, right? So many people read this. And here's an article here telling them that 16 scientists all think that there's no need to panic about global warming. Unfortunately, what the people reading this article don't know is how many hundreds of blogs would have reacted to this um, addressing it. So with our plugin installed, we've got, currently got nine rebuttals to that page in our plugin. So someone using it visits that page. An alert actually pops up on the page it lasts about five seconds, but that number stays on our icon. You click on our uh, plugin, and this drop down comes down, giving you a few links. Um, not all of them, because we wouldn't fit, so we just give four, and you click through and see the um, bigger list if you want to, or just click straight through to one of the rebuttals there. Um, so how the, how the whole thing works is we have to be crowdsourced. At the moment, there's no software engineer or system on earth that can um, identify the natural language of claims versus rebuttals, context. Um, someone has tried something similar, but it's very challenging. So we need people to participate, to identify a rebuttal, to see a rebuttal article and go, this is a rebuttal, I can add it to rebuttal. Um, exactly as the, the story that I um, uh, told you at the beginning, where I found a page which I wanted rebutted, that's very hard to add unless you can Google it and find a rebuttal. But when you start at a rebuttal, and all being skeptics, you're more likely to read the rebuttal first. You read the skeptic blogs and they are rebutting someone. So when you read these blogs and you read, you know, blah, blah said and that's full of whatever, when you read that, just think, this is a rebuttal, I can add it to rebuttal. And once you're at that stage, adding it to rebuttal takes about 20 seconds. I'm going to demonstrate that in a few minutes. Um, you also have the ability to subscribe to subjects and pages. Now this is really interesting for bloggers and for people who just want to stay up on current topics um, and what's happening in the news in particular areas. So if you subscribe to something like homeopathy, every time someone adds a rebuttal to a homeopathy um, website, you'll get an email. And more interestingly, every time someone goes to a homeopathy article and there's no rebuttal for it and they hit the request button, which is the next thing there, you'll get an email of that as well. So that brings me to the next thing, you're able to request rebuttals. So sometimes, in, when I found that natural news article about vaccines, I couldn't find the rebuttal. So if I had have had this tool, I could have gone request a rebuttal, and then had an email sent out to all the people that are subscribed to that topic, and if, right now, if I had have requested a rebuttal for that today, I guarantee there'd be at least 10 people subscribed to that tag who would know of, um, the rebuttal that's currently in the system, which is 
Respectful Insolence. Because most people, I think, here probably know of that blog and would have just known that he's covered it already. Um, at the time, I didn't know anything about the blog. And I suspect most people out there were the same sort of skeptic that I was a year ago, which is, you're skeptical, we know that it's crap, but we just don't subscribe to the blogs, listen to the podcasts. Not everyone does that. So how do we reach those people that aren't sure but aren't part of the community? So that's what we want to do, is reach out. Um, and yeah, and the final thing there is at the moment we're building a requests and rebuttals feed. So more like the Reddit sort of format where you have that curated page of um, time decaying um, feed of rebuttals and requests in the system. So create more of a community feel for it. Um, and just quickly, the last thing on this before the de I do a demo is, so we launched public beta in March. We started working February. And since then, we've already got 2,000 users, and we're growing every day. Um, 600 links in the system. Now, that's the number we really want to get a lot more of. We want to get a lot more links, because there's so much content being created. Um, and we've got 1,200 plug-in cl click-throughs. And that's to do with the actual um, plug-in. We, people can navigate via the website as well. But what we've been tracking here is how many people are just browsing, and they land on a page, and then the plug-in gives them an alert, and they can click through. So people are using it now. Um, I will quickly open up the demo. Okay. So, this is a uh, a page I came across the other day when I was trying to find some things to rebut. This article is quite amazing. Um, the guy that runs Natural News wrote it himself, apparently. Um, and he tells uh, everyone what skeptics actually believe. And it's, it's a hilarious read. But anyway, I managed to find a rebuttal for it. So actually, I probably should have started. What will often happen is you, know, you read Respectful Insolence, and <laughs> the title is A Pyromaniac in a Field of Straw Men, or a Black Hole of Burning Stupid Incinerating Every Straw Man in the Universe. It's a fun rebuttal. So if you, you, know, you subscribe to this blog and you read it, it's quite obvious what he's doing. And he'll usually link to you know, the page that's being rebutted. So it's clear what's happening. All you need to do at this point is click on the rebutter icon. Pops down. This page is the rebuttal. Click. Go to the other page. Rebutter. This page is the source. Click there. And now the URLs are source and rebuttal URLs. A quick comment. Something simple. So this is a straw man argument. And then some tags, just so everyone knows what uh, topic it is. So I'll go. I can't see the screen while I'm typing it. Doesn't matter. Um, what do I want? Skeptics? Go science. Science. Pseudo science. No, I'll just, just blank. Enter. So I just hit enter and. We're on 4G at the moment, so. Um, and then I've just added that now with the typo and everything. I'll fix that later. <laughs> um, and now there is a page. So this is one of the good things we have in the system is Google will actually recognize this page over time. So as we get more action, we'll get more Google attention for it as well. But um, yeah, we have the source page, the rebuttal page, and I actually made an error. I didn't um, select. Edit now. This is a direct response. I should have done that. So um, we have the ability to differentiate between direct rebuttals and general. And that's important because in this case, this article is directly rebutting this page. But sometimes um, a simple example is answers in Genesis could be rebutted by the Wikipedia article on evolution. Um, generally, it provides the evidence that contradicts 
the claim page. So I like to differentiate between those two you know, because I think they're two important differences. One last part of the demonstration is, here's another page. Um, this is an article they put on just the other day, just as a simple example of there's currently no rebuttals to this. So if you're looking at this and you're like, well, that's dodgy for whatever reason, you can click on that, and then there's just a button to submit a request. Select your tags, so is it the health? Homeopathy. There you go, that'll do health and homeopathy, submit. And that goes into our feed of requested rebuttals, and anyone that's subscribed to health and homeopathy will be emailed with the alert that someone wants a rebuttal to this. And if someone knows of any, they can add it. Um, so that's it, it's that simple. Adding it takes 20 seconds, requesting takes three seconds. And the consequence of this is when we reach out to the wider community, and that's happening organically, like we posted to Reddit one, one comment in the um, Reddit subreddit of skepticism, and it spread to um, Hacker News, Life Hacker. Um, someone from New Scientist contacted me, um, is doing an article on error checking on the internet. So we're getting a lot of natural, spontaneous growth from it, which is very exciting. So what I'm really trying to do, particularly here at TAM, is to find as many skeptics as I can who are subscribing to the blogs, the skeptic blogs, who can read it and go, this is a rebuttal, add it, just take the 20 seconds so that as we grow into the general population, every time someone adds the homeopathy rebuttal, you know, someone's saying, well, homeopathy is real because here's a study that shows there was an effective rate or something, there's someone that's subscribed to that tag that can then react with, yes, but there's this statistical error with it. There's someone there to react. We need that skeptical core to make sure we have got, you know, the rebuttals for every page that gets added. So, um, that's rebutter. Um, if anyone wants to come and ask any questions after, I'm happy to do so. And I have some t-shirts and actually on the, um, the forum table outside, I've got some fridge magnets, which I've got like the rebutter logo on. So, thank you. Let's, uh, let's, give, let's give old Mike a web of trust rating while we're here. <laughs> Uh, that was Web of Trust is also a plugin that comes down the same way, so I just hit that and hit the rate, and uh, I don't like Mike. <laughs> that's the, that's as easy as Web of Trust is, right? Click click. You can also leave comments. Oh, I already left a comment here. <laughs> <laughs> but you can leave comments down here, and you can vote on the comments. So if uh, and. Uh, it's super easy. Uh, start doing this stuff. It takes five seconds. You can take a few minutes out of the day and do a little bit of this. If everybody who's here at TAM started doing this a couple minutes a day, imagine the, the change we would make. And I'm sorry we ran a little bit over time, but I hope you got something out of it. <laughs> Crowdsourcing projects are all over the place now. Uh, probably the the ones that you hear about a lot, or at least have heard about for a few years, are the wisdom of the crowd uh, type projects like Wikipedia, that sort of thing. But there's also crowd voting, where people uh, vote on different things and, and try to find the best items in a, in a group. There's crowdfunding, which has been getting a lot of attention lately, things like Kickstarter, where folks who might have had to go to investors to start their company can now just put their idea out there and say, hey, you know, here's my crazy idea of a thing I want to build. Do enough of you want to do this that you're willing to toss in a little bit of money? And you start a company or you start a project. And people have done record albums and built products and built games that way. And actually, inducement prizes are kind of a type of crowdsourcing, too. And um, it's not new. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary uh, actually ran an open call that was essentially a crowdsourcing project for 70 years for folks to send in quotations that uh, went to the sources of and uses of different words. And that was a giant crowdsourcing project. It wasn't done on the internet, obviously. It was done through the mail. Um, inducement prizes, the, there have been many. Uh, the uh, SpaceX prize and and whatnot. The Orteg Prize was the prize that Lindbergh was going after when he flew from New York to Paris. He was, he was after a prize. 
And they basically, essentially that's a crowdsourcing project. I mean, you have one winner, but essentially you're saying anyone out there who thinks they can fly from New York to Paris, try it, and the one who does it wins. And the Pillsbury Bake Off is another example that went for years and years. So what are the modern ones? What are the internet-based ones? We've got Wikipedia is probably the most famous. They've built an encyclopedia with over three million articles. It might be four million by this point. Uh, entirely by just asking people to type stuff, to write about things that they know about. Um, citizen science projects like Galaxy Zoo, Whale FM, and there's probably a couple hundred of them now, and you're going to hear more about those projects from Pamela Gay this weekend. A uh, fantastic thing where uh, science is gathering so much data now that we need, and, and our software isn't smart enough to classify all of it, so we need people to help. And I talked about Kickstarter. Another one is more on the kind of uh, commercial side of it is there's a thing called Amazon Mechanical Turk, where literally you can just put jobs out there that have tiny uh, cash values on them and say, here, will, are you willing to spell check three sentences for a buck for me or something like that? And people will sign up and earn money doing it. Uh, and the idea here, part of the idea here, are some examples of things that can be slacktivism sometimes. Forwarding emails, retweeting things. Uh, you know, that is helpful to get the word out on some things, but if you're just retweeting stuff and, and feel like you're advancing skepticism just by retweeting stuff all day, you know, maybe it's not helping that much. Clicking like, there, everybody wants you to click that stupid Facebook like button now. It's useful to get things more visible in Facebook. It definitely is a useful thing to do. But if you're, all you're doing is clicking like, I, I don't know how much, thing you're, how much help you're, you're, you're causing to skepticism. Changing your avatar, a big pet peeve of mine that I'm going to talk about on Sunday is bombing online polls, which seems to be a big hobby of some folks. Really a tremendous waste of time. Um, Science, some online petitions are a waste of time, not all of them. Some of them can be very effective. You have to be careful about how you set them up and what your goal is. Um, but, uh, and again, none of these things are inherently wrong. I'm not saying don't do these things. If you want to change your avatar, by all means, change your avatar. But don't lull yourself into a sense that you're making a difference when all you did was change your avatar. Um, so how do you distinguish? What's, what's a useful crowdsourcing thing that you can do and what's a, a slacktivism? Uh, one of the things is, will it achieve a tangible goal? Like, you know, if, if, it's a, if it's a petition, it has to be a very focused petition with a specific target and a specific goal that's achievable. Um, and if it's creating content, think about where is this content gonna be a year from now or five years from now. If you're writing a comment on page 15 of a forum thread, uh, is anyone going to see that a year from now? Uh, probably not. But if you're writing content, for instance, in Wikipedia, maybe it will still be there. Uh, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, are there more direct ways you can help? Um, or are you just doing busy work? Um, so what are we trying to do? What, what is the idea of all this crowdsourcing stuff? Uh, well, we're trying to do the things that skeptics say they're doing, which is educating the general public about science and critical thinking, right? We want to break out of this, let's all talk to ourselves about how great skepticism is and how horrible the latest quack of the week is, um, and let's get out to the public and, and warn them away from the quack of the week. Another thing is just basically improving the quality of information online. I'm an information guy, a website guy, and so uh, to me, a lot of what skepticism about is about boils down to misinformation, right? Fundamentally, misinformation, bad information, whether it's science or a conspiracy theory or pseudoscience or whatever, it's all misinformation at its core. Um, and we want to improve the quality of information online or at least cause the information This is uh, workshop 3B.
uh, the future of skepticism online. We're going to do some crowdsourcing, or we're going to talk about crowdsourcing. Uh, I'm Tim Farley. Um, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction section here. I'm going to talk about kind of the overview of what we're talking about, and then we're going to get into the actual tools. This is none of this is theoretical. Uh, all of this is actual stuff that skeptics are already doing, and we need more skeptics to do it. Um, uh, I am uh, Tim Farley. Um, I am a software guy, uh, a researcher. I'm a uh, research fellow for JREF. I advise them on uh, uh, electronic media, internet stuff, that kind of thing, and I blog for them. I've spoken at the Amazing Meeting before. I've run workshops before. And probably most people know me as the creator of the site, What's the Harm? Um, but lately, I do a lot of blogging at skeptools.com, and a lot of it is about how skeptics can use tools better on the internet. And the other presenter is, is Derek Colanduno, who you probably know as the host of Skepticality uh, with Swoopy. And he also runs an awesome skeptic event, if you guys ever get to Atlanta. In the summer, uh, Skeptrack at DragonCon. It's a really fantastic event. We do probably almost as many panels and stuff as we do here, uh, but it's in, embedded in this giant science fiction convention, so we get to do get a lot of exposure to folks who might have not known what skepticism was. Four full days. And we're going to have a special guest presenter at the end, something brand new. Uh, that I think you'll be excited about. So what am I talking about when I talk about crowdsourcing? Uh, crowdsourcing is a portmanteau of crowd plus outsourcing. And the idea is that you make an open call for participation. You have something to, that needs a lot of work done. Uh, something that if you were going to do it in a conventional way, you would end up hiring a million interns or a, a thousand high school students or a, a whole staff of people to do. But you don't have the money to do that. So you, hire, you put out an open call, and you say, hey, anyone who's out there, can you help us with this project? Um, and they vary. You, sometimes you bring knowledge. Sometimes you bring money. Sometimes you bring uh, the ability to do a little bit of work. Sometimes you bring some experience. But it's all about undertaking some kind of a task. And hopefully the idea is you get some mutual benefit. The person who put out the call will get whatever the thing was they want put together. And the people who help will get some benefit in the way of experience or just the knowledge of a job well done or contributing to a good effort. And there is to have some inclusion, have a way that skeptics, all skeptics, can help participate in projects that are helping to advance skepticism. You know, there's a lot of great blogs and podcasts. I have a blog. I'm on Derek's podcast. There's many other podcasters here, and they're all doing awesome stuff, but not everybody has time for that, right? Uh, frankly, I don't have time <laughs> to do the ones that I've committed to most of the time, uh, which if you've looked at my blog in the last few weeks, you know that, because I haven't posted that much because I've been getting ready for this meeting. Um, but the neat thing about crowdsourcing is, is you can do it in tiny little increments. If you want to help with Wikipedia, you can literally spend 30 seconds helping with Wikipedia and then go on about your business. And you've actually accomplished something that helps move the ball forward. And the idea is that by finding ways that skeptics can get involved in this and advance skepticism through this, we can get more skeptics involved. Um, and you can do it anywhere you have an internet connection, right? So you can do it from your couch while you're watching TV. Uh, and we need all the skeptics we can get to help out. Uh, another reason to do this sort of stuff is outreach. Uh, another problem somewhat with blogs and podcasts is they tend to sometimes preach to the choir, right? We tend to build skeptic blogs that talk to other skeptics about skepticism, and, uh, and it becomes this circular loop. Uh, how do we break out of that and, and actually reach the general public and t teach them about the things that we know about, about cognitive biases and pseudoscience and all this good stuff? So the idea is there's so much commerce going on on the internet and so many different things going on on the internet, there's a lot of opportunities to intercept people while they're on their way to become a victim of bad information, while they're on their way to become a customer of a homeopath or a psychic or something like that. If you think about how people do that, there are ways to get in front of them. 
using the internet. And it's an awesome opportunity. We didn't have this opportunity before. You know, 30 years ago, how would you intercept someone when they were about to hire a psychic? Would you stand in front of the psychic's building all day? Nobody could have done that. But there are things you can do on the internet to get people's attention right while they're trying to find a psychic. Um, one of the things I'd like to warn you about is you have to think a little bit about what kind of projects you're working on. Um, there's this thing that some people call it slacktivism, some people call it clicktivism, but it's sort of this false idea that you think you're doing something useful, but really you're kind of spinning your wheels online. Uh, there's a lot of kind of feel-good things that people try to get you to do online. And they're great, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with them, but there's the danger sometimes that you lull yourself into the sense that you're actually helping a project when the things that you're doing are actually not, um, not doing anything. You have to think about what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, here, that's good to be a little bit more visible and that perhaps the information that's bad be a little bit less visible. And we want to warn, warn the public about dangerous things. So all of these projects involve getting involved in a community and we will later in this, uh, we will talk about some, some projects that were built specifically for skepticism. But a large part of this is kind of co-opting uh, crowdsourcing projects that already exist. Um, and one of the things that you have to be aware of is you have to be aware of community 101. You have to be part of the community, okay? You can't just go in guns a-blazing in Wikipedia and say, okay, the skeptic's here now, I'm gonna fix all your pages. Um, you have to be part of the community. Wikipedia has been around for 10 years and there's a lot of people who spend a lot of their life on it and they don't appreciate the new guy coming in and making a mess of things. And one of the things you can do to lessen that fear of the new guy is to play by the rules, create an account. That's mainly a Wikipedia thing. Most sites make you create an account. But Wikipedia will let you edit without even you know, signing up. And I recommend that you never do that because it's just, it's looked at, you know, it's, people take a dim view of anonymous edits. Fill out your bio if there's somewhere where you can say who you are. Do post an avatar if there's a way to put a little picture. It doesn't have to be a photo. You can have a, you know, whatever piece of art, you know, you want. If you can, now I know a lot of people use an, a, a, a moniker, an anonymous name online for various very good reasons. And that's fine, but if you can reveal your identity and you're comfortable with that, that can be good too. Uh, for instance, uh, Wikipedia has rules that you're not, you're not, you're supposed to honor if people are being anonymous. Uh, but I, I am very upfront about who I am on Wikipedia. Uh, be nice to other people. <laughs> very simple. Participate in the various processes. If there's a friending process or a follow process, if there's ways that you're expected to interact with the other people on the service, do that. Um, understand the rules, you know. Uh, it's, it's very important that every site has its rules, has its expectations of its users, so you've got to do that so that um, you'll be f people will feel like you're part of the community. And I, I always recommend to go slow at first. Now some of the things we're going to talk about are fairly simple. When we talk about Web of Trust, there's not a ton uh, to learn on Web of Trust. So go slow may not apply there, but go slow definitely applies on Wikipedia. There's a big knowledge curve there in terms of learning how things already work. And a lot of people on that site that already know how it works. So you need to go slow at first so that you don't get yourself into trouble. So ask questions, get permission. Um, most of these sites have ways that you can interact with the other users.